Dr. Perry inventoried and preserved the Theodore W. Allen papers, edited and introduced Allen's class struggle and the origin of racial slavery, the invention of the white race, authored the developing conjuncture and insights from Hubert Harrison and white supremacy, and, and authored the introduction, study guides, and various appendices for the November 2012 second edition of Allen's two volume, The Invention of the White Race. Additionally, Dr. Perry has authored Hubert Harrison, The Voice of Harlem Radicalism, edited and edited and introduced Hubert Harrison's When Africa Awakes, the inside story of the stirrings and strivings of the new Negro in the Western world. Dr. Perry's work focuses on the centrality of struggle against white supremacy to progressive social change and efforts. Without further ado. Thank you. very, very much for coming. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about Theodore Allen, Theodore W. Allen, but I'm also going to talk about Hubert Harrison. They are two, I believe, two of the most important thinkers on race and class in the 20th century. They are both autodidacts, self-educated, working class intellectuals, um, and they're only now really growing in, into increased importance as people get more familiar with their work. And I also preserved Harrison's papers, and we're at Derek Columbia now, a big 102-page finding aid, and we're going to be putting them, hopefully, up online, a lot of his things. It's wherever we can, try and do this stuff, get it up for free and make it available. So I've got a lot of slides, but I think it's not going to be boring. I've got a number of these, um, because the subject matter is so important, and these people are so good. So this is Alan. He lives from 1919 to 2005. He's a working class intellectual activist. Not all the slides you're going to have to read, but some you might want to. He's born in Indianapolis, lives in Paintsville, Kentucky, that's Appalachia, right? Um, Huntington, West Virginia, where he graduates from high school. It's got the lowest SM essay <laughs> at the time he read, you know, it's the, the statistical area. He goes right into the coal mines, and he lives his last 50 plus years in Brooklyn, New York, 97 Brooklyn Avenue, that's Crown Heights, Bed Stuy, and that's where he lives. And, uh, He's a former coal miner. He was president of three UMW locals, factory worker, teacher, postal worker. He was a postal worker. I was a postal worker. Harrison was a postal worker. And so we might talk about the post uh, And he worked at the, in his last years, he worked in the Brooklyn Public Library doing the homework hotline for the next up and coming generations. Alan pioneered his class based, class based white skin privilege analysis in 1965. If you go online and you look up white privilege, the first line is going to say white privilege theory holds that all white people benefit from white. That's not what Allen says at all. And he, his analysis was much deeper rooted in class issues and it took effect. In 1969, the New York Times ran a front page article on how the SDS, the Students for Democratic Society, the national student movement, was waging an all out campaign against white skin privilege. So it's not all this 1986 stuff that comes along, you know, and that, that you know, all of a sudden people are coming to understand white privilege. There's a much deeper history. He pioneered his invention of the white race analysis, which is what we're going to focus on, starting in 74 and 75, and I'm going to get into some of the development of that analysis. He wrote his, his life's work was the invention of the white race um, in 1994 and 1997, in 2012, we came out with a new expanded edition. I did lots of supplemental material, internal study guides, front matter, back matter, lengthy index. And his last unpublished work was towards a revolution in labor history. But I have all Harrison's papers, all Allen's papers, and we're looking to place them in a major repository. As a matter of fact, in about a week, some, uh, the people are coming up to take it very seriously so we can finalize some decisions. Here's his pamphlet, Class Struggle and the Origin. This is 74-75. There's the two-volume work. I emphasize, we have them here. Everything in the back is being sold, as I understand it, at cost. So there's no profiteering. So if any people are interested in this stuff, whatever we have here is available. The internal study guides make it good for group discussions or even for individual studying. The titles of his two volumes, the subtitles are Racial Oppression and Social Control and the origin singular of racial oppression in Anglo-America. Allen is very precise with his words. He's very careful. He's well thought out. Um, and we'll speak about this more as we get into this. 
But so he focuses on racial oppression, social control is key to his analysis, and origin singular. Why does he use origin singular? Because it has the specificity that he desired. As in Darwin and the origin of species, or Engels, the origin of the family. As Alan explains it, I meant it to be consistent with the argument of the book, which shows class struggle to have been the origin of racial oppression. U.S., right? Okay. Fellow named Carl Davidson was head of one of the student SES way back in the 60s. He's still active. He's got online university of uh, the left and uh, committees of Christ. does a number of things. But one thing he wrote, and he knew Alan back in the 60s and all, over the last 30 years, he, had, he pointed out, you have to work to get three, through these two volumes. Alan's, uh, Alan's work is a two-volume work. He goes, but once you do, it will change your life and outlook forever. You simply can't understand America and who we are without this book. And I want to echo that. I threw it up there because I think it's accurate. Alan's volumes are combined about 800 pages, but they're 35% footnotes and appendices. It's rigorous scholarship. I call it good proletarian scholarship. He wasn't driven by trying to get tenure or anything like that. And he spent years going through this, pouring through original primary records, particularly in 17th century Virginia, which is what volume two is about. To make things easy for people, because they are, they are very heavy tomes, right? He did a summary in two parts of the arguments in the book. Each volume part one and part two, each 50 pages. They're free online. They're available free online. And wherever possible, try and put a lot of this stuff free online. You'll, if you go to my webpage, I'll give you, there's my webpage address right here. Uh, just my name. You find it easy. If you forget it, Jeff Perry scandal. I use my middle initial. He was stealing some of my hits, right? So, nobody. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Tough audience. All right. Uh, some of other published works by Alan. I just want to point. Well, these are on my webpage. White Blind Spot in 1967. This pioneers. This is picked up by the Students for Democratic Society and a lot of the young, the youth movement of that period, and they run with it nationwide. And he includes. A, uh, uh, an essay, Can White Workers, he cross out workers because the big problem was can the white radicals be radicalized? He didn't keep the conclude. He wrote a critical review of Edmund Morgan's American Slavery, American Freedom in a uh, monthly review. Now Morgan, people, if you're not familiar with him, fought at uh, Yale. He was president of the Organization of American Historian, very well respected colonial historian, does much good work. And he's the one that's mentioned in Michelle Alexander's um, major work, right? So, but Alan offers some very important criticisms of Morgan, which we're going to get into. He, uh, in defense of affirmative action in employment policy, a very timely, still, essay, race and ethnicity, history in the 2000 census, which focuses on the Hispanic category and how it is used by the decision makers politically. You know, it's a very good essay, I, and it's got a history of who's comprising this Hispanic category and why the Census Bureau goes through all these machinations and how they try and deal with it. And at first, Hispanics can choose their race, you know, nobody else. And he gets into, and the main, one of his main points is what, what they're trying to do, amongst other things, is by allowing Hispanics to choose their race with the dynamics in this society it will extend the majority or at least the plurality of the white category for a little further period. So you can have the uh, mirage of a democracy, you know. Um, it's very interesting. And a critical review of David Rodiger's Wages of Whiteness. On my webpage, top left, but lots of other places, is an article that was written for Daedalus. That's for the American, originally for Daedalus, American Academy of Arts and Science. At the end, I explain what happened to the publication. But it's a lengthy article. It's the fullest treatment of the development of Alan's thought and also some major insights from Harrison, who I write about. I encourage people to read it. If you're, it, it, it lays out and it grapples with a lot of <coughs> issues that if people interested in fighting against white supremacy will encounter. It includes a statistical overview. And the statistical overview, I didn't want to We've got a lot of slides to go through, but basically it was written a few years ago, but it's true today as it was when I wrote it. And it lays out with the statistics and everything with footnotes and links so you can go find the sources. The gap between rich and poor is extreme and widening. It's at record proportions. 
Poor and working people are suffering deeply under capitalism. Comparisons with other advanced capitalist countries show how poorly we are. And we, I look at health care issues and maternity leave and paternity leave and social safety net and things like that. And the last one is there's a definite white supremacist shaping to each and every issue we look at. Okay. okay. When Allen writes The Invention of the White Race, because that's what we're going to focus on, in 1994, the first volume, he writes on the back of the front uh, of the cover, uh, back cover, when the first Africans arrived in Virginia in 1619, there were no white people there, nor according to the colonial record would there be for another 60 years. The word white does not appear in a Virginia colonial record until 1691. That's not just merely a matter of semantics. The white race as we know it was not functioning. Now this is deep. This is far different from what I was taught when I was in school and probably what people here were taught, you know, were taught, taught about white indentured servants. They weren't white, right? And as a matter of fact, you're going to see they weren't indentured, the overwhelming majority. Uh, they were chattel bond laborers, but we'll get into that. Um, so Alan, and he bases his statement on examination of 865 county years. He spent eight consecutive months down in Virginia going through, pouring through these records, and then he'd come back after he's at their uh, library repository, and he'd have handwritten notes, and he'd type them up and stuff, a thousand pages, any place a laboring class, man or woman, European American, African American, had a voice in a court or a hearing or any record, he had recorded, right? And that's the basis, that's the foundation that he drew much of his analysis from. So, he writes, the others living in the colony at the time were English, they had been English when they left England, and in Virginia their children, they were English, they were not white. White identity had to be carefully taught and would be another 60 years before the word would appear as a synonym for European Americans. Here's one example, John Punch, I don't know if you've heard this name. But John Punch, by, by 1640, a system of chattel bond servitude had been instituted in Virginia. I'm going to explain how that happened. But he was a bond servant, as was Victor, a Dutchman, and a Scotchman called James Gregory. And the three of them tried to escape their bondage, and they got caught. And there's a court proceeding on it. But what's important here for this purpose right now is they're not white. It's a Dutchman and a Scotchman. What's also important for those who like to probe into these historical things, John Punch, Ancestry.com, did a piece on John Punch about four years ago. Turns out John Punch is related to Barack Obama, right? He's the African man who they tried to sentence to lifetime servitude. He, and they tried to sentence him to a lifetime servitude because um, there was no lifetime servitude. There, there was a punishment, right? Or there was there may be a, a few instances, but... That, that wasn't it. They tried to extend his service. It wasn't even lifetime. They weren't that clear. But um, John Punch, it turns out, is related to Barack Obama, but he's related to Barack Obama on his mother's side, mm -hmm. not his African father. So it's an interesting story. Bacon's Rebellion. Allen focuses on Bacon's Rebellion, 1676 and 1677. Bacon's Rebellion, in the second Civil War stage, the people at the bottom of society rose up. They kicked out the governor. His name was Barclay. They burned Jamestown, they controlled six-sevenths of the land for nine months. Major rebellion, and it was one, there were about ten such, not that big, but ten re rebellions or uh, revolts or mini episodes like this between 1660 and 1676. In Bacon's Rebellion, when they send people to put the rebellion down, here's a fellow named Thomas Grantham, he's a ship captain, and he talks about what happened when he tries to put the rebellion down. He goes, there I met about 400 Negroes, English and Negroes in arms. Still not white, right? And they were much dissatisfied. I told them I would willingly surrender. You know, he lied to them and that they were all pardoned and freed from their slavery. He explains how some were for shooting me, others for cutting me in pieces. They weren't playing, right? And he goes, most of them I persuaded to go to their homes, which accordingly they did, except about 80 Negroes and 20 English. Still not white. You won't find the word, right? Allen argues Grantham's account is supreme proof that the white race did not exist. Um, and it also shows that in Virginia, laboring class African Americans and European Americans fought side by side for the abolition of slavery or bondage. It was actually bondage in that period. 
So here's Allen's main theses. There are three. I'm getting them out early because we're going to come and develop them. First, the white race was invented as a ruling class social control formation. It serves ruling class interests. It's created and invented by the ruling class. Not all like, people in the white race are ruling class, but it's a ruling class social control formation in response to labor solidarity. That's where this class analysis that I mentioned <laughs> earlier comes in, as manifested in the latter Civil War stages of Bacon's Rebellion. The way it was done is a system of racial privileges was deliberately, this is not happenstance, this is deliberately instituted by the late 17th, early 18th century Anglo-American bourgeoisie. And Allen, he was, he was a leftist for years before he started writing this stuff, he taught political economy, he knows capitalism and stuff, he explains the capitalist relations of production. We'll get into that. So it was the bourgeoisie, they were trying to make profit on these plantations, and they, they instituted this system of racial privileges in order to define and establish the white race and establish a system of racial oppression. I'm going to explain what I mean by racial oppression a little bit, what Allen means. And here's what's very key about Allen's analysis. The consequence of this, what they did, was not only ruinous to the interest of African Americans, it was also disastrous for European American workers. So we got poor whites down south, right, you know, and throughout this country. And the position vis-a-vis -vis of the rich and powerful uh, was not improved, but weakened by the white skin privilege. So what Alan's arguing, here's some quick little slides, the invention of the white race was political. The white race is a ruling class social control formation. It must be understood not simply as a social construct. In 1997, a guy named uh, Fredrickson writes, uh, he's out at Stanford, he writes, and he goes, well, the understanding of race as a social construct is increasingly commonplace in the academy. Allen says that's not enough. If you just say it's a social construct, you leave the back door open for the Daniel Patrick Moynihan's and the Dinesh D'Souza's and those who will argue, yeah, but what would you expect if you have inferior family life or inferior um, cultural life or things like this. He goes, no, you've got to put it where it belongs. It was done by the ruling class to serve their interests. Very important analysis. The white race is an all-class association, as defined in this country, held together. The key is the racial privileges of the laboring class people, because that keeps them supporting the system and, and relative to African Americans. He argues it is the most basic prevalent and historic form of class collaboration. I come 32 years out of the labor movement. The worst thing you can do is to betray your, your co-workers, right? To be a class collaborator, side with the boss against your, your other workers, right? That's what the white race is about, though. It has served as the principal historic guarantor of ruling class domination of next. I'm sure that most of the people here want to see serious social change in this country. That's my assumption coming here. <laughs> We've got to deal with this because it's been the principal historic guarantor of how they maintain control. He says white supremacism, pumping these ideas, has been the Achilles heel, the main weakness of the labor, democratic, and socialist movements in this country. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And the white, ident white identity, now take what he's taking it deep, is the main barrier to class consciousness.